the better. Yes. Tonight, David Muir riding shotgun on real life cases. Jaw dropping surveillance tapes you'll only see here. Husbands who want to kill their wives. My wife betrayed me. The suburban soccer mom who wants the other woman wiped off the earth. I wouldn't care if she was in a horrible, horrible, horrible car accident okay. and mangled up. But here's the secret the hitmen they're hiring are really undercover federal agents. So as you sit down with 2020, how many of you are in disguise? Tonight, 2020 on the inside. The elaborate plots, the makeup, the fake murders in the woods. And when they get what they think they paid for, dead spouses watch him smile. Okay. What they really get is busted. She says to you, she feels like she's living a lifetime movie? Yes. That's a little bit of 2020. And you'll see it all go down. Murder for Hire. Here's David Muir and Elizabeth Vargas. Tonight, a stunning network exclusive. For the first time, a group of hitmen coming forward together and sitting down with 2020. And they have a giant secret to reveal. These hitmen are actually undercover federal agents. And who's hiring them? Tonight, exclusive surveillance video from the suburban soccer mom with specific instructions to another case, the husband with a jaw-dropping plot of his own. But what no one knows is that cameras are rolling, and all of you at home are about to see it all unravel. In every corner of America right now, people with criminal minds and black hearts are plotting, looking for someone to do their dirty work. A scorned lover, husbands who want their wives dead, women who want their husbands taken out, even children plotting against their own parents. She tried to hire a hitman to kill her father. Tonight, we go inside the secretive and very real world of murder for hire. Just listen to this wife. What do you want done? I want him more than hurt. Hello, I understand you want him dead. <laughs> then there's this Massachusetts husband who wants it done and quickly. I'm not playing any kind of games here. All I want is mission accomplished. We take care of business and we go our separate ways. And the Michigan wife, who wants her husband gone, doesn't care how ugly it gets, as long as it's not in the house. Because it, it would be messy. In the house. All of them ordering a hit, like most of us ordered dinner tonight. In fact, listen to this number. In just the last month alone, more than 30 cases of murder for hire making national headlines, one a day. And those are just the cases we hear about. And then there's Guillermo Vasco, the young husband who married a pretty doctor from Massachusetts. And what you're watching is the surveillance video of him about to hire a hitman to kill his wife. My wife betrayed me. I'm gonna make it look like she disappeared. He wants her killed and buried 10 feet under. How soon did he want her dead? As soon as possible. Do you want it to be painful or you want it done quick for her? Uh, your money. Yeah, I have to pay. Ken is the hitman hired by Guillermo. And tonight, he's not the only one coming forward. A group of his comrades, all men hired to kill, boarding planes, getting into their cars, and on their way to sit down exclusively with 2020. But these men all have a secret. They're undercover federal agents with the ATF, posing as hitmen. They meet us at ATF headquarters in Washington, D.C., where we have makeup artists waiting. Have you ever been to your makeup show before? Just this morning. That's okay. We'll they sit down to have their appearances completely changed. I'm feeling my feminist icon right now. Oh, there's nothing feminine about the brows I'm about to give you. You're not going to want to wear that out tonight. <laughs> Prosthetic noses, cheeks, facial hair. The disguise is the only way they can truly reveal what it is they do. Jean Marie Laskus knows the stakes. She's reported on their hidden world for GQ. This is really extreme cop work, heroic cop work that the public does not know about. You got 30 minutes. Our clock rolls, and after more than three hours, they're ready. And we have never seen an entrance quite like this. Walking in to sit down with us. Gentlemen, good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome. It's nice to meet you. The agents offer up first names only. Jose. Yes. And? I'm Lenny. Lenny, your real name? Real name. Ken. Ken, your real name? Yes. You're real here? No. <laughs> <laughs> so just a show of hands, how many of you are in a disguise today? All but one in disguise. Lenny, and the only one no longer working undercover. Their appearance is so transformed, so over the top, even these hardened agents 
are humored. I mean, when you look in the mirror with that getup, does it shock even you? Yes. Yes. But, but those are the stakes. That, right. Did any of you send a photograph to your wife? I, I sent a photograph. Yes. yes. One agent tried to FaceTime with his wife and baby boy right before our interview. He just had this crazy look on his face like he didn't know who I was. <laughs> Who's my daddy? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. As for Ken's wife. She said I was a cross between a biker and a lion. <laughs> and while these disguises may look comical, the very real danger these men face is no laughing matter. Because you'll be back on the street tomorrow. Yes. What do they want in a good hitman? Well, someone's going to carry out the job. Someone more ruthless than them. Exactly. You know, just like you'd go to find a plumber to come to your house and fix a pipe, they're looking for an expert to take care of their problem. And these are dark people. These are dark, dark-hearted people. But how do you find a hitman? I mean, you're not in the yellow pages. There's no phone number, no post on Craigslist. It's a business, like so many others, that thrives on referrals. Which brings us back to that husband, Guillermo Vasco, who, while behind bars, started asking around for a good hitman to kill his beautiful wife. But how does he want her killed? Slowly, and he wants her to suffer. He says that? Yes. And why? It turns out Guillermo Vasco came all the way from Ecuador to America to marry that wife, a Massachusetts doctor he'd met while she was visiting his country. They would have a baby together. But authorities say when the wife started to see behavior that worried her and wanted out of the marriage for good, he showed up at the door to win her back. So when she says, we're not getting back together. He kneeled down in front of her and out of nowhere took a piece of duct tape and put it right over her mouth and had a knife, and he said, you have to listen to me. Sergeant Sheila McDade says he attacks her, their two-month-old baby, right there. He had a five-gallon can of gasoline with him, and he said, this house is where all our problems started, and this house is where it's gonna end. We're, we're all gonna die. We're gonna go to heaven today. She wasn't supposed to get out of there alive. They were gonna die that day. But she breaks free and escapes with her baby. Guillermo is arrested. Now sitting in prison a year after that arrest, and he is still working to kill her. She thought it was behind her, though, didn't she? Yeah, she thought that he's going to be put away for a long period of time. It's over, and here it is. You know, it, it, she can't escape it. You know, this guy's behind bars, and he's still trying to come at her. But when asking around for a good hitman, Guillermo makes a critical mistake, asking another inmate who turns out to be a snitch, tipping off authorities with the ATF. How do you get wind that he wants to hire this hitman? Uh, I had a confidential informant in the jail. Someone provided reliable information in the past for us. Initially, he wanted both the wife and the infant daughter killed. We developed a plan that we we're going to have an undercover special agent pose as a hitman and go into the jail and meet with Vasco one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. And that hitman is Ken, wearing a hidden camera sitting right across the table from Guillermo as that husband pulls out a letter he'd written using a special code in case it ended up in the wrong hands. He talks about his wife as a dog and the infant as a puppy. So he's talking about his family as a couple of dogs. Yes, exactly. And he says the old dog is too old, won't be able to make the trip. Our friends and their dog, Nikki, uh, we take this trip down there. Nikki is very old I and mean, she's sick. She wants to buy this trip. No, this is my wife. Okay. Okay. Right. So. We need to, to put her to sleep. And that's code for? Kill my wife. Kill my wife. Yeah. And incredibly listen as he offers instructions right down to how he wants her buried. We can bury the hair out of Massachusetts. We be just perfect. Yeah, you know, it'll probably go north. Because yeah. Maine, not many people up there. Lots of woods. Just make sure that uh, be, be, be more than 10 feet down. So she doesn't show up again. And um, do not forget the cement. As long as I make her go away, then she's not going to show up again. Do you really want her in cement? Yes. To keep her down? Yeah. When somebody hires a hitman, they're looking for someone who's going to encourage the job, go along with it. Yes. If they say, you know, I want them, you know, the throat slit and buried over here, you get that conversation, you may throw out another idea, like, well, what do you think about this? You know, I'm a hit man, I have to have ideas. What do you think about putting her in the water, though? In the water, they disappear. You load her into those drums, you know, weight them down, get them down, they get eaten. There's not much left. I think I like that idea, really. Done. She'll be killed in the woods, stuffed into an old drum, and dumped at sea. Watch as the husband goes over pictures of the wife's house, where she's now raising their baby. 
then he pulls out his own hand-drawn floor plan to help the hitman. And now, the money. What does he offer you? He offers me a rare coin collection um, that he said was worth thousands of dollars. And this whole thing's being recorded? Yes. Outside those prison walls, Agent Matt O'Shaughnessy hears the plot, the payment, but it turns out he wants more. So you're about to take this much further? Yes. You won't believe they're about to enlist for help. You approach his wife. To put her husband away for good. She wanted to nail her husband. She did. What they're about to do with that wife in the middle of the woods. You have got to see this when we come back. Twenty twenties murder for hire continues. Once again, David Muir. Already behind bars for trying to kill his wife, Guillermo Vasco is still trying to finish the job. He's hired a hitman, or so he thinks, to silence her for good. And he knows exactly how he wants it done. He wanted to suffer before she was killed, and he wanted to know the last thing she said before she died. So he didn't want this fast? No. He's going to pay for this murder with his coin collection. He wants her shot, stuffed into a barrel, dumped at sea. But he wants cement. He even brings up the Lacey Peterson case, saying he doesn't want to make the same mistake as that guy, Scott Peterson. I don't even want to have that happen. What's happened with, uh, with this guy? No, I know what you're talking about. Right? Because he was an idiot. That's not how I do business. And I said, do I look like an amateur? Uh, you know, I'm an expert. The body will never be found. But that hired gun, Ken, is actually working undercover for someone else, the ATF, along with Agent Matt O'Shaughnessy on the outside, about to pull the trigger on a plot of his own, even more colorful than Guillermo's. So you approach his wife? We did. And what do you ask her? I told her of the plan that her soon-to-be ex-husband wanted her killed. Was she surprised? Shocked. How long was it before she said, listen, I'm in, I'm gonna help you? Within minutes. She wanted to nail her husband. She did. So what do you do? We had hired a movie makeup artist to make her up like she'd been shot. It's something straight out of the movies. So we go to the very same apartment in this quiet Massachusetts suburb where the police have a small field office. None of the neighbors knowing that behind this door, that wife was getting a makeup job she would never forget. Detectives help us reconstruct that day with a stand-in for the wife. So as she's sitting in this chair, the makeup artist is crafting a bullet wound in her forehead? Yes. And what is her demeanor? Very quiet, you know, just kind of going along with everything. She knew what she was doing? She did know what she was doing, yes. She had to do it. She really had no choice. For the safety of herself and her child, she knew that she had to do it. With a lifelike bullet wound right in her forehead, fake bruises and scratches on her hands, Mrs. Vasco and Sergeant McDay drive to the woods for a scene straight out of a horror movie. Mrs. Vasco looking so graphic, they have her cover herself with a hood, afraid they would frighten the other drivers. She wore a hood yeah. to cover up the makeup while yeah. you were driving. Yeah. Because people who looked in the car would think, right. you're just beating her. Remember, Guillermo wants his wife murdered deep in the woods, which is right yes. where they're headed. Yep. We came down here and um, walked down this path so this was the area you had selected? Yes. So you bring her out here and you ask her to do what? Well, she was asked to lay in um, different positions. Again, they help us reconstruct the scene with that stand-in. To make it look like there had been a struggle. You actually took her shoe off? Yes. Mm -hmm. And mixed her in with the leaves? Mixed her in. And then she laid there and had her picture taken as if she had been killed. It was the performance of her life but in the end, too close to home. Right when it was all done, she just let go, and she cried, and, and, and um, really, she, she, she just released every emotion. And it's not over yet. Now armed with those grisly photos of a dead wife, it's time for Ken to go undercover again as the hitman. So you've got these photographs now, and you're headed back to the jail. How realistic do these images look to you? Very realistic. I mean, it looks like this person was tortured, beaten, and murdered. Ken is now back at that prison, about to show Guillermo what he's done. And when you show those images to him? I tell him, well, listen, you know, it's done. And here it is, and I slide a picture across the table and show it to him. And just watch right here, the smile beginning to appear on Guillermo's face. 
this sick grin comes across his face. No remorse, no nothing. It was just pure evil. It really was. It was joy and evil in his face um, at the satisfaction of knowing that she was dead. What did he say? He wanted to know that I let her know that this was for Guillermo. He wanted you to say that? Yes. This is for Guillermo? Yes. And I told him that's exactly what I did. And take a closer look right here as that husband casually looks at the photos of his dead wife. At one point, we hear him ask about the hole in her head. This is his hand. The 22 hole. Okay. How do you like to work? It's speechless. He wanted to know if that was a bullet wound. Yes. We nodded in approval. That you'd shot her in the head. Yes. Okay, so this is a good day for you. Yeah. Well, everything's, everything's moving forward. Thank you. I made sure she realized it was from you. Thank you. I just thank you that I know my friendship. He said, I have you give him an undying respect and loyalty for what you had done. So there was no question he was pleased? No question whatsoever. He thought his plan was carried out? Yes. Armed with everything they need, the undercover team about to return to that prison with their own surprise for Guillermo. Oh, good seeing you, man. At first, telling him his wife has disappeared. He denied any knowledge of where she could be. Was he concerned at all that his wife was missing? No. He didn't show any emotion towards it. He kept saying he didn't do it. He didn't know what they were talking about. And so they decided to bring me in. And when you walked into that room with your badge hanging around your neck? You could just see his shoulders slump. His head kind of dropped down. He was shaking his head. Tears started coming out. And he knew he had been had. Where were the tears for his wife? There were no tears for his wife. Those tears were for him. He realized he was going to jail for a long time. Good work. And as for the wife, who had long ago washed that gruesome makeup off her face, she was finally ridding herself of the husband who had hoped that bullet hole was real. She saw the video. I mean, she saw it. You know. She saw her husband. Yes. Look at those photos mm -hmm. and smile. Mm -hmm. She did. Still a doctor, still raising that daughter. I can't say it enough. She, she really. I mean, she's a hero, and um, she's just an amazing woman. Woman, very, very strong. She figured out a way out. She did. When we come back, caught on tape in broad daylight, the soccer mom right there in a supermarket parking lot. Shoppers, workers walking right past her with no idea what she's plotting from inside that car. I know I've watched too many Lifetime movies. Just want to make sure you're not like an undercover or federal oh, agent. Okay. What she wants done and how. Do I want someone to just take her out? Do I want me to go into the house with my silencer and take them all out? And what she does that stuns the agents when we come back. Murder for Hire returns with David Muir. Across the Hudson River from New York City, the part of New Jersey known for neon, noir. The version of Jersey made famous by the Sopranos and the mob boss who called the shots. But the plot we're tracking tonight is about to play out in broad daylight with a much different boss calling the shots. Right there on surveillance, that's Nicole Facenda, a suburban soccer mom and a scorned lover. Sitting in a supermarket parking lot, unsuspecting shoppers pushing their carts right past her. So she's doing a little shopping and then she comes out to meet with the hitman. Yes. Because that's what most people have on their grocery list. She did. <laughs> shopping for flowers, she says, but cops believe she's in the market for murder. Hi, Hi, how are you? Have a seat. Plotting revenge on the other woman. So what can get done? You could just make her disappear. You could, what, what can get done? All right, when you say disappear, like you want out of this state or you want to, you know? Like, so you're saying you could just go break her legs or you could go do exactly. anything. And who is she trying to hire? You'll remember our hitmen who are in fact undercover federal agents who've agreed to sit down with us as a group for the first time ever. But to do it, they spend hours getting disguised. Among them, an agent we're calling Jose covered in a sort of goo before he gets a brand new appearance. They make a mold, and from there, they build new features for his face. There we go. Okay. The same agent who would sit in that car with that scorned lover. I don't want to keep beating him on the bush, but as I said, hurt or dead, either or. And it turns out, it's not just her first time ordering up a hit. This is his first time as the hitman. And he takes us to where it all began. 
we rigged the car to avoid showing his face. How did she get to this point that she wanted to kill another woman? She was angered at the fact that he was leaving her and she wanted her dead because she wanted to get back at him. Nicole's bad breakup, smiling here with that limo driver boyfriend, but that boyfriend with a double life. A few exits down the parkway, he has another girlfriend named Jennifer, a nurse. And it turns out, another family, two children with her. She's just a bitch who's been involved. I think she's like 30 years old. She's got two kids. You don't want to hear the whole thing. But she wants the boyfriend to live. She wants him to live because she wants him to grieve. She wants to watch him suffer. Yes. Nicole in the lonesome corner of a love triangle. And nobody puts Nicole in a corner. A little grocery shopping, a little homicide, just the cure for a broken heart. I've played every scenario through my head a million times. Do I want the car to go off the, the highway? Do I want someone to just come up and take her out? Do I want me to go into the house with my silencer and take them all out? Like, I've, I go to sleep every night thinking. She goes to sleep at night wrestling with how to murder the other woman, but wide awake just a few cars away in that supermarket parking lot, federal agents listening to her every word. Among them, Agent Angela Mullins. So she has no idea that as she's talking to the hitman, you're right here in the same parking lot listening to the whole thing. No clue. And what are you listening for? To show that she wants to carry this through. So you're listening to make sure that she really wants to kill this guy. Absolutely. For days, every secret meeting, every phone call, every text message intercepted. And all of it given exclusively to 2020. So the whole time there are shoppers in the parking lot and there's a murder being planned. And she's planning to kill someone. Murder for hire in America. On your lunch break. But nothing in that car is what it seems. The guy in the back seat right there is the man who introduces Nicole to the hitman. So she's thinking of the darkest person in her life, the person who might know a hitman out there. Yes. Ironically, the guy she relies on for help is a relative of her ex-boyfriend. And she asks him what? She asked him if he knew someone that uh, is willing to kill someone for her. He knows right where to find her a hitman because what she doesn't know is that he's long been an undercover informant for the feds. You just tell him the scenario and he'll get it done. No case of rock rock. What's going through your mind when the person across from you wants someone killed? You just wanted to yell at her. What's wrong with you? You have to sit there with your poker face and, okay, this is what you want done. This is what I'm going to do. Suddenly, the first test for that first time hitman. She thinks he looks more like a cop than a killer. She told me I didn't look like a hitman. So my question to her was, what's a hitman look like? You look like one today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> today too. <laughs> Nicole appearing very nervous, leaning far away from Jose. Only her hand in view at this point, and Jose tries to reassure her. Okay, I heard you had a problem with somebody, and I'm here to take care of your problem. But what is it you want me to do with your problem? Um, okay, I don't know. Fix my problem, I guess. How do I fix your problem? You tell me what you want me to do, and I can see to it that it gets taken care of. But how is it going to get taken care of? How do you want it to get? I mean, well, that's why I'm here. And watch right here as Jose is about to be interrupted. Soon, looking down at his phone. She's going to do something to you, so you want to do something to her in return? He's reading a text, and it's actually help from those agents listening from a nearby car, now coaching him. But listen to how he explains it to that suburban soccer mom, saying it's just his friends texting. I'm asking about some beer. And we listen in as Jose goes down his mental checklist, right here offering the standard hitman disclaimer, her out. You gotta be serious about you know what I mean? Because once it's done, it's done, there's no turning back, you understand that? And while Nicole may be new to this life of crime, she's a quick study, because as it turns out, she has seen a lot of TV. I'm just trying to make sure you're not like an undercover a federal oh, agent, okay. and like all of a sudden cars are all over. <laughs> if I get arrested, I'm going to lose my job. And just listen to what she says next, fearing she's a star in the making. And I know I've watched one too many lifetimes. I'm in a horrible, I'm horrible... <laughs> We've watched too many Lifetime movies. This is, this is about TV now. So she says to you, she feels like she's living a Lifetime movie? Yes. Now she's living a 2020. <laughs> Are you worried at that point this thing could go down the tubes because she is so suspicious? She's looking around, looking for cameras, and at first, you know, that is a little bit unsettling. And Nicole is not only suspicious, in that supermarket parking lot, she demands a price check. And so do you have, like, a price list? If you want it there, it's going to be five up front, five at the end once it's completed. That's it? Ten? Yeah, you need ten. She thought my price was too low. 
She thought you were a cheap hitman. Yes, she actually did. She raised the money. It's funny. <laughs> you guys got to talk about your rates. <laughs> I know, really. Watch as Nicole leaves the car with a smile on her face, laughing after the deal she got at the supermarket. When we come back, you'll hear from the soccer mom now describing exactly what she wants done, stunning even the agents. I want to go piss on a grave. I want to go to her funeral and spit in the gantry. And then the most critical moment of all, and suddenly she's missing. And you're waiting, and you're waiting, and she's not here. Agents fearing, has she done something on her own? What happens? When we come back. Once again, David Muir and Murder for Hire. A sunny afternoon in broad daylight and at the top of one shopper's list, the murder of the other woman. 2020 given exclusive access as federal agents listen in just a few cars away as Nicole Facenda plots the murder of her romantic rival. But so far, she's cautious and careful with her words. You know what I want. I want to be dressed in black. <laughs> no, I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. The hitman, really that undercover federal agent, now wondering, does the suspect suspect? And I'm sorry that I'm crazy watching some great lifetime movies. That's all right. But they keep going, and two days later, another parking lot, another conversation. See, I, like, would think that either she disappears and she's just never found, like these people are never found. Okay. Like, that would be one good thing. I wouldn't care if she was in a horrible, horrible, horrible car accident okay. and mangled up and, you okay. know, I don't, I don't care. Like, gone. I want to go piss on her grave. I want to go to her funeral and spit in the gas. So you want to see her dead? Is that what you're saying? I will be happiest when this woman is dead and buried and six feet under. I've but Nicole is now digging her own grave. And when asked what to do with the ex-boyfriend, it turns out, kill the woman, keep him. She says, get rid of the woman. You know, shoot him in the foot or something. I don't want him hurt, but if he's limping around, if he has a cast on, who cares? She wants to see him suffer. She wants to see him at the other woman's funeral. But perhaps darkest of all, listen to this. When asked what to do if the other woman's children get in the way, let me tell you, I don't think I'm a bad person, okay. but if something happened and one of the kids get killed, oh well, I'm sorry, you know what? So if the kids get in the way, take them out. Take them out. Kill them. Yep. She agrees to pay $20,000 for the murder. And look at this, authorities giving 2020 the photo she texted to make sure they get the right woman. And then she texts the picture of the girlfriend. Yeah, it doesn't get any more serious than that. And you remember the husband in the last case. He wanted proof, a picture of his wife shot in the woods. In this case, they offer Nicole the same thing, a photo. She doesn't want any Kodak moments. She wants something else. I can get him to get, give you a picture of her dead. Finished. I don't want a picture. Let him get busted with the picture. I don't want any pictures. I'm gonna go to the funeral. She doesn't want a picture. She wants to go to the funeral. She wants to go to the funeral. She wants that satisfaction, knowing what she's done, and kind of savor it, which is quite sick. Now, they need just one more thing to nail her, the cash. They set a meeting place. If you're right here at the Olive Garden, people are having dinner, mm -hmm. like most people would at the Olive Garden, right. and you're waiting for her to show up with the cash. Right. And you're waiting, and you're waiting, and she's not here. Exactly. And no sign of her. No sign of her. Suddenly, stood up by their dinner date. Concerns racing through their heads. Has she changed her mind? Does she now want out of that Lifetime movie? Or worse, has she taken action on her own? They finally get her on the phone. Hey, where are you? And where had she been? Her son's soccer game. So you get her on the phone? Get her on the phone. And where is she? <laughs> she's over at the Exxon. Over here. They learn she's now just a few hundred feet away. Okay, he's moving. Who's going to go now? The agents scrambled their wires, their cameras out of position. Listen, he's going to have to walk over to the Exxon station. But the informant, the bag man, gets to the gas station to fill her up. She hands you the envelope. Mm -hmm. And what's inside? Her down payment. Cash. How much cash? She did $2,000. So basically, it's a down payment on murder. It's a down payment on murder. You got her. Yep. 8.36 p.m., Special Agent Longy. This concludes the undercover meet. Two days later, the informant calls Nicole to tell her that the other woman is dead. Listen to me. Listen to me clearly. Jennifer's dead. 
No way. Jennifer's dead. But the other woman, of course, is very much alive and now in protective custody. Told by Agent Mullen, someone wants her killed. Pulled over her vehicle and informed her that there had been a threat against her life. And what did she say? And the first thing as she was shaking that came out of her mouth was that, is it Nicole? She knew who it was. She knew who it was. The other woman. The other woman. Agent Mullen takes us to the hotel restaurant where Nicole manages the catering in charge of the baked goods, having no idea what they baked up for her. She has no idea that you're about to move in. No, no clue. They send the confidential informant in first wearing a tiny camera and watch right here her reaction. Outside, she lets loose. She was actually annoyed that the man who was helping her kill the other woman had now shown up at work. She says she can't believe it, and she doesn't believe he did the job. I don't believe either one of you at this point. I don't believe either one of you. Moments later, she is under arrest. So after you lock her up, you talk to her? Yes. Does she have any remorse? None at all. And the tears in the back seat of the police cruiser? Were they for the girl she tried to have murdered? They were only for herself. And tonight, from a federal prison in West Virginia, where that soccer mom is now serving 10 years after pleading guilty, she is reaching out to 2020 in an email accusing the feds of baiting her. I was at an emotional low point in my life, and they took advantage of that. She says, I am not and never have been a violent person. I was a woman destroyed by emotions, and I am paying for it dearly. But that hitman reminding us in that car, in that supermarket parking lot, he gave her several outs. I want to make sure that you know what you're getting yourself into when you want this done. And when you look back on that, that rookie case? She got honestly what she deserved. When we come back, could you ever do this? The job no one would take. The one undercover hitman about to say yes, trading his family and his home for what could be months behind bars. The only thing protecting him, those surveillance cameras. And you won't believe what happens to him when those cameras suddenly go dark when we come back. Twenty twenties murder for hire continues. Once again, David Muir. Ask any of these hitmen, these undercover agents, and they'll tell you by the time it gets to this. You want him dead? Time is running out. In many cases, the clock is ticking. The clock is definitely ticking. Because you know that person's life is in danger. Because if they don't hire that fake hitman, they'll hire a real one. In every case, these men putting their own lives in danger. But there was nothing quite like this. As I understand it, several agents turned this job down. <laughs> they did. Uh, I don't blame them. Because to save the next target, Letty has to give up his gun and do something extraordinary. But not before doing this, trading life with his wife and two children at home, and instead moving in someplace else. The Warren County lockup in Eastern Virginia, posing as an inmate. His new home, overcrowded and filled with criminals. Murder, rape, robbery, arson. And all of a sudden you're in prison with all these all guys. All of a sudden I'm in prison. You were prepared to be there for how long? A month. And here's why the moment that started it all. Look in the driver's seat right there, a drug dealer about to be busted. All right, got white SUV on location. Got him. The person getting in on the other side, a federal informant, Dave Jackson, who was buying drugs and helping the feds nab the bad guy. All right, by the time you get back, I'll be calling you. The drug dealer is arrested. And now behind bars, he is fuming. He wants that snitch in the passenger seat wiped off the earth. If he can get the federal informant killed, then he, he's scot-free. He's scot-free and gets out of jail. But the bad guy needs a hitman to get the job done. And when the feds hear that that drug dealer now behind bars is asking other inmates, does anyone know a hitman? That's when they decide to send Lenny in as a fake inmate, a fake hitman. And just look at the photo we brought to our interview. So this is Lenny, huh? <laughs> that is me. They laugh, but most wouldn't if they ran into someone who looked like this, his beard grown, wearing shackles, and wearing his new wardrobe, just one of his new uniforms, here in his orange jumpsuit, and posing as a hitman now, serving some time, but about to go free, 
The story is he'll soon be available to kill again. Lenny will never forget what the guards did to him moments after that door slammed shut. Because remember, even the guards don't know Lenny is not a criminal. As we were getting ready to do the strip search, that's when I thought, I didn't think this through. <laughs> I didn't think this through. You didn't sign up through. for that. Yeah, I was like, oh, I did not think this one through. 2020 going behind those walls, through the locked doors, straight to the cells, where Lenny was thrown in with the criminals. Do you still remember the moment you walked into this place? Yes, I do. What was going through your mind? As soon as that door closed behind me, I was in at the window at that point. You booked him. I did book him. I mean, he was just normal. He was normal. A normal criminal. There is no bed for Lenny, and he has to steal a bunk from another inmate. So you had 40 or 50 inmates sharing the space with you. Exactly. You can hear the inmates just over the, the wall here. You had to find your own bed? Yeah, I just had to displace somebody else and take their bed to make it mine. Displace somebody else. Right. And remember, Lenny is here because that drug dealer, somewhere in here, wants to hire a hitman. But Lenny knows in order to nab him, he must now live the life of an inmate. This is where you were showering. This is exactly. So just give me an idea of where you're going to the bathroom. I'm using a communal toilet like this one right here. The toilet is right here on camera. Right there on camera. In front of everyone, including the security guards, watching on surveillance. Inside, we see some of the inmates have calendars scratched on the wall, crossing off the days until freedom. The whole time, Lenny wondering when his freedom will come. You're hoping you're not going to end up the little spoon in a weird situation. That's a metaphor. <laughs> yeah, that's a metaphor. But his worries soon replaced with adrenaline. Because word comes that the bad guy, the drug dealer J.R. Hackley, now knows there's a hitman behind bars right there with him. And just listen to what he's been told about that hitman. This guy's got bodies hanging on him. So this guy's got bodies hanging on him means you... you means I've killed people in the many. past. And Hackley says... Hackley immediately contacts me. And what does he say? I need this guy taken out. Like, what do you mean by taken out? I need him gone forever. I need him, you know, eliminated. And you're thinking... I'm thinking this is a home run. But in this high stakes game, a sudden curveball. Because while all the guards and inmates believe Lenny is a real criminal, he knows the one thing protecting him are the surveillance cameras. But then a huge storm hits. Everything, every one of those cameras knocked out. Suddenly these cameras go dark. So I'm in here without cover, without uh, any backup. But incredibly, even in the dark, listen to how quickly things move. He meets the criminal, he plays the role of hitman, and he's hired for the job. How's he gonna pay you? With a uh, motorcycle. Within hours, the cover team now gets him out. And all that's left is the murder. He's off to the murder scene and right there waiting, the guy he's supposed to kill. The federal informant that was once sitting in that passenger seat buying the drugs, nailing the drug dealer, now talking to 2020. In order to convince him that you were dead, they concocted a plan. They came to me and said, look, we're gonna fake your death. But even before federal agents can give him the script, direct the scene, he turns out to be quite an actor. I said, I'll, I got this. He tells them what a drive-by shooting should look like. I was laying down something like this. And this is the photo they took, proving the hitman had done his job. That snitch snuffed out. And look at this, as proof that they killed him, they take that photo and insert it, putting it onto the front page of a real newspaper, giving it a headline, unidentified man found shot to death. And they're about to take that newspaper to the criminal who wants him dead. And just listen to what he says.